Hi comrades and welcome to another episode of Marxist Voice, podcast of the Revolutionary Communist Party. This episode will be listening to another talk from 2023's Revolution Festival, this time on Are Communists Amoral? Communists are often depicted as violent and bloodthirsty provocateurs who would stop at nothing to achieve their aims. But our accusers are the very same people responsible for the horrific slaughter in Gaza, Sudan, Congo and countless others across the world. In this talk, Ellen Morton will explain the difference between their morals, the morals of barbarian and bloody class society, and ours, the morals of the slaves in struggle to end slavery. Without further ado, this episode of Marxist Voice, brought to you by the Revolutionary Communist Party. Today's discussion is based on the question, are communists amoral? I'd like to start with a quote from someone that definitely thinks communists are amoral. Um, Vladimir Tismanou is a anti-Marxist, virulent anti-communist, and he is one of these proponents of this idea that communists are completely amoral. He says, uh, it's quite funny as well, he always writes in the past tense as if communism is like over, so he might get a nasty surprise in the next few years. But anyway, he says, uh, the problem with Leninism was the sanctification of the ultimate ends and thus the creation of an amoral universe in which the most terrible times crimes were justified in the name of glowing tomorrows. This fixation with the future and the readiness to use the most atrocious means to attain it is a feature of all ideological utopias, but in the communist experience, it reached grotesquely tragic limits. So this criticism here that you can hear from a number of different commentators is of a moral perspective where each action is, anal is kind of analyzed for itself by its own merits, instead of the idea of a fixed moral code that some things are good and they are always good and they are right, and some things are wrong. They are always wrong, they're always bad. And the idea that if you don't believe in this, if you don't believe in this fixed morality of good, of right and wrong, good and evil, you will always end up kind of accidentally, accidentally committing atrocities. And kind of through this idea, Marxists are painted as these kind of amoral, obsessed creatures who would do absolutely anything, who would lie, who would cheat, who would murder, who would decapitate, all in order to achieve their aims. They're just fixated on communism, communism, do whatever, whatever it takes. Um, and this view isn't just espoused by this um, guy that I quoted, but a range of bourgeois commentators. And they usually then try and draw in the experience of Stalinism as kind of evidence for their, for their views. So they argue that due to this lack of moral, um, moral code by communists, the lack of morality by communists, the fact that communists are amoral led to Stalinism and the crimes of Stalinism happening as an inevitability. So basically blaming the Stalinist reaction, the degeneration of the USSR on the supposed violence of the revolution itself and of the supposed amoralism of those who led it. And obviously there's a number of issues with this. Part of it is due to the way that they understand kind of Stalinism and, they, and dictatorships and things like that. They kind of just list a number of features, like maybe it's secret police, arbitrary detention, these different things and say, well, this is a dictatorship and this is bad. Uh, instead of understanding history as we would and understanding events in relation to each other, we would look at the USSR, for example, at the Stalinist regime, for example, dialectically, we would look at it in relation to what came before, the direction it's going in a historical process of change. Like I said, we would understand it as, as a reaction. Um, and a quote from Trotsky on this question, he says, Stalinist frame-ups are not a fruit of Bolshevik amoralism. No, like all important events in, of history, they are a product of the concrete social struggle. So again, we don't believe that Stalinism was just a static dictatorship that just like one day appeared. We see it as a bureaucratic reaction against a revolution in an undeveloped and isolated country. And it was that historical process that determined its character rather than the violence of the revolution or the lack of moral codes or anything like this. Um, and when we look at this issue of you know, communist amoralism or the lack of a moral code, we are attacked by kind of bourgeois morality for this, on this question. But actually, when we take a moment to look at bourgeois morality itself in a bit of detail, 
Okay, you could say maybe there is a generally understood moral code, but it's used extremely flexibly. It's changed all the time. It's excused. There's all these different reasons that, oh, well, not in this circumstance, not in this circumstance, all these exceptions. And it's actually used to justify almost anything. Um, so one example would be the question of violence, right? So generally, bourgeois morality, violence is wrong, bad, evil, peace is good. That's, that's kind of how it goes. And, you know, on October the 7th, when Hamas attacked Israel, the news was kind of filled of reports of all this violence that had happened, and the politicians all flood to make statements. Violence is wrong, violence is wrong, violence is wrong. Okay, I guess that kind of follows the, the moral code we're talking about, violence is wrong. There was a joint statement by the heads of France, Germany, Italy, the UK, and they said, we condemn the terrorist actions of Hamas, which have no justification, no legitimacy, and must be universally condemned. So again, violence good, peace bad. I know, ah, violence bad, <laughs> peace good, right? This is, this is what they say. Yet, a few days later, the Israeli government begins a brutal and indiscriminate bombing campaign of, of civilians in Gaza, institutes a siege of all the people living there, cuts off the internet, cuts off the electricity, cuts off water, the most horrific violence we all are witness to, and yet suddenly this moral code completely disappears. In fact, it's turned on its head. This is seen as completely legitimate, completely right, completely within a moral code, part of Israel's right to defend itself. Um, and in fact, one day, so we see one day violence is horrendous, and universally bad. The next day, violence is totally, totally justifiable. And actually even calling for a ceasefire, calling for a ceasefire becomes morally wrong because that would not give sufficient consequences to Hamas. So while the, the bourgeoisie like to say that there is an innate moral right and wrong, there's a fixed moral code, they themselves do not follow this at all. And every single event, I'm sure there's lots of examples, maybe people will come in uh, in the discussion with these, every single event shows that their attitude on the correctness of lying, the correctness of violence, the correctness of theft, murder, all these things that are apparently wrong, their, their attitude to this completely changes. One day they will be wrong, horrendous, immoral. The next day they'll be perfectly fine because of this or because of that or because of the other. So it's quite clear the bourgeoisie themselves, although they like to say they have this fixed moral code, there's this right and this wrong, their actual response to events shows that is not the case. And when we look in a little bit of detail about how they react to events, we see their real moral code is that actions which protect the interests of the bourgeoisie are usually seen as morally right, correct. And actions by those fighting their oppressors are seen as wrong. Um, and so on this question, I would like to bring in a quote from John McLean, um, a, a Scottish Marxist who was hauled into um, court um, for kind of organising and he was being attacked by all of these different claims of you're doing this, you're doing that. And he said, I am not here then as the accused. I'm here as the accuser, the accuser of capitalism, which is dripping with blood from head to foot. So we can clearly see that bourgeoisie, despite what they say, um, have, have no moral values of their own, except for those being used to defend power. So we've kind of seen their approach to morality. But what is our approach as Marxists? And to kind of examine that question, we need to have a bit of a deeper look at the questions of what, what is morality? What are morals themselves? And what do we base ascribing something as right or ascribing something as wrong? And the question, the key question here being, are there eternal moral truths? Are there things which are always right and things that are always wrong? I would say the general understanding in society is that there are. If you go to the street and ask someone, um, I'm sure most people would say, oh, I think killing is wrong, I think stealing is wrong, I think slavery is wrong. Um, but again, we are Marxists, we need to remember that Marxism is a science, and we don't just kind of follow general common sense understandings in society, we don't base our political uh, views on those. We use analysis, we actually think about have people always thought that killing is wrong? Have people always thought that violence is wrong? Have people always thought that slavery is wrong? And the clear answer is no, that on all moral questions, the attitude has changed over time, quite considerably, in fact. And that shows us that morality is not something that is static. <coughs> morality is something that reflects wider society. So if we look, for example, at the question of slavery, nowadays most people view that as wrong. But if we were to go to ancient Rome or ancient Greece, 
and ask people, especially the citizens, um, they would, I don't think they would even be able to answer the question. They would find it ludicrous that people were even questioning if slavery was wrong or bad because their entire society, their entire existence was built on slave labor and therefore their morality would reflect that. Um, another question would be adultery, for example. Is it wrong to cheat on someone? Again, I'm sure most people would say, oh no, that's wrong. Um, but if you went to another kind of society where, where marriage didn't exist or monogamy didn't exist or individual marriage wasn't a component of the society at that time, they, of course they wouldn't have a moral code around that. They would find it bizarre that you were even asking such a question. They wouldn't understand what you were even asking. And I think that shows us that morality is a product of the epoch that you are living in. Morality is not something natural. It's not something innate. It's not something that comes from within. Morals come from the society that we live in, and they are enacted and reproduced through things like religious rules, um, through the laws that the state kind of has at the time, and through moral norms that are taught through education systems and families and all kinds of different ways that, that um, they kind of reproduce themselves. And they change and they reflect the situation, the position, and the interest of the ruling class. And that's because morality is actually a key part of ideology in a given society. So thinking about ideology, class society, whatever it is, involves a minority living off the unpaid labor of the majority, right? That's, that's what class society is and ruling over them. And to do this, they obviously need various weapons um, because again, it's a small minority ruling over everybody else. So there's physical means in our current society. We have the police, we have the army, we have all these kind of things. But this isn't enough just by itself. So we also have ideology, which is in some ways like the way of seeing the world, kind of explanations and half-truths which the ruling class espouses so that people kind of, to justify its own system, to justify its existence and to justify and maintain its power. And morality is a component of ideology. It's a way in which the violence of the oppressors, as we've seen, is justified, but violence used by the oppressed is condemned. And our role as Marxists is to strip away ideology, is to strip away these illusions and to reveal the false nature of bourgeois ideology. And I've got another quote from uh, Trotsky on this point. And he says, from the point of view of eternal truths, Revolution is, of course, anti-moral, but that merely means that idealist moral morality is counter-revolutionary, that it is in the service of the exploiters. Now, some might disagree with what I've just said, that, that morality changes over time and depends on the system you're living under. Some people might argue, for example, that some moral values change maybe over things like ownership or maybe over slavery but some things are always seen as right or wrong no matter what society you're living under and killing is quite often um an example that's used pretty much all pretty much most if not all societies have some kind of moral codes moral judgment rules around killing people um, and that is true um, but i would argue almost all societies do have these rules over killing but i would argue that doesn't reflect some innate or some natural moral norm for all humans no matter where they're born there are some morals that are um, common in many many different societies but this simply reflects the most basic things that we need to live together in a group so it's obviously understandable that there's moral codes around killing in most if not all societies, because if people were just going around killing each other all the time, then the society wouldn't last very long. For us to live together in a group, there needs to be some kind of rules that we can't just all kill each other. Um, and even these rules, like most societies have rules around killing, there's always exceptions to this. There's always places where it doesn't quite, it isn't quite followed. So in our current society, you can obviously you're not, it's seen as wrong to kill, but if you're in the army, you can kill. In fact, it's your duty to kill, and it's wrong not to kill. Um, you're a deserter. And in self-defense, there's usually rules around killing. I mean, even the death penalty, the state itself in many countries, even though it says it's wrong to kill, is then the one killing people. Um, so I think all of this shows that, again, morals are not innate. They're not natural. They're not something we're born with. Um, at the most basic level, there is n they are nothing more than rules to say, this is something that's right, this is something that's wrong. This is something you should do, and this is something you shouldn't do. This is what our society says is permissible, and this is what our society says isn't permissible. And the idea 
that morality could be anything but that, rules that society has made, the idea it could be innate or natural or eternal, this is actually just a religious hangover from, from the past. Um, and, and on this point, Trotsky says, whoever does not care to return to Moses, Christ or Muhammad, whoever is not satisfied with eclectic hodgepodges must acknowledge that morality is a product of social development, that there is nothing invariable about it. It serves social interests, these interests are contradictory, that morality more than any other form of ideology has a class character. So if we see morality as a kind of set of rules in society that reflects the interests of the ruling class, where does that leave us as Marxists? Is there a kind of Marxist morality? And in a way, there's not. We don't believe in fixed or universal moral codes. We don't believe that some things are always right and some things are always wrong and you should just memorize this and go out into the world and follow it. Because, as I said, the current morality of rules of things being right and wrong, um, this just serves to protect the interests of the ruling class. But does that mean that we believe that all actions are permissible? We should just kind of do whatever we want. There's no right, there's no wrong, just go and give it a shot kind of thing. Well, of course not. We don't believe you should just go and kill people randomly or just lie randomly. Um, we don't, but at the same time, we don't just have a list of things that you should and shouldn't do, like some kind of religion. Like I said, it's a, a religious hangover. We are a scientific philosophy. Before deciding if an action is permissible or not, we need to analyze it. We need to think through the consequences and weigh up the action. Um, and there's a, cor a common moral axiom, the end justifies the means, that, that the validity of an action should be judged by its consequences. And we do follow this to a certain extent, because I mean, if you're not judging an action by its consequences, what could you possibly be judging it by? That, the only other way is, again, if you just have a set of rules in your head, this is always right, this is always wrong, based on complete thin air or hangovers from the past. So you have to judge an action on its consequences. But we would say this alone is not enough because, okay, the end can justify the means, but then what justifies the end? You can judge an action by its consequences, but its consequences based on what? So for example, killing. Is it justified to kill for a nation? You have to then justify why you think a nation should be justified and things like that. Is it justified to kill for God? Again, we would say no, because we don't think God is real. So you have to analyze not just the end justifies the means, but also what justifies the ends? What are you trying to achieve through this? What are you fighting for? And again, this is very different to bourgeois philosophers because they never justify their final ends. And I would argue the reason they don't is because their ends are maintaining the status quo. And, and if they had to justify that, it would be quite obvious to everyone that their morality is just based on maintaining their power. So for us as Marxists, when we're trying to decide if something is moral or not, again, we don't have some outside code. We weigh up an action based on its consequences on the class struggle with our aim, which is liberating society. Um, so we would say that not permissible or morally wrong would be actions which set parts of the working class against each other, actions which lower people's consciousness, actions which make the class docile or dependent, actions which deceive the masses. We would say this is morally wrong because that is completely against our aim of the working class taking power of society. Um, and on this point, Trotsky, looking at what we would see as correct, morally right, permissible things we should be doing, um, Trotsky says, permissible and obligatory are those and only those means we answer which unite the revolutionary proletariat, which fill their hearts with irreconcilable hostility to oppression, which teach them contempt for official morality and its democratic echoes, which imbue them with consciousness of their own historic mission, raise their courage and their spirit of self-sacrifice in the struggle. So looking at a concrete example, the question of lying. Us as Marxists, would we say it's right to lie, it's wrong to lie? Well, we would say it's wrong to lie to the workers. Because again, that goes completely against our aims, our mission, um, to increase the knowledge of the workers, to increase their power and, and um, to help them fulfill their historic role in, in society. But if you're arrested by the secret police and asked where your comrade in hiding is located, will we say, well, you know, it's wrong to lie, so here they are. Of course not, of course not. We would say it is right to lie. In fact, it's obligatory to lie. It's correct to lie. Um, 
And I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't say that's actually very different to how most people live their lives in reality. But I think the way official morality, bourgeois morality portrays it is, oh, it's wrong to lie, accept this, accept this, accept this, accept this, accept this. And we, in fact, would say, well, no, there is no fixed eternal right or wrong. You have to analyze a, a perceived a, an, uh, an action and its actual cons consequences um, in the real world. Um, so, in terms of the question of what a um, of what a kind of future, how a future communist society might look at the question of morality, would there be a kind of a communist morality, like I said, in the future, um, a proletarian morality? Well, I would say to a certain extent, yes, there would be a common understanding of right and wrong, and um, there's things that that workers would need to live together in a group. I think um, in terms of a proletarian morality, it would be seen as wrong to just have senseless violence. Because again, what, what is that doing? How is that helping the society? I think non-work, not participating in maybe the running of society. Um, these would be seen as wrong, undemocratic, um, undemocratic you know, methods. All would be seen as wrong. But I also think there would be, or I hope there would be less of a view of morals as natural as eternal. There'd be less people saying, well, no, vi senseless violence is wrong because it's wrong. Not participating in the running of society is wrong because it's wrong. Because again, that shows not very developed understanding of morality. It's just rules someone's learned. I think instead we would see people saying, well, no, not participating in the running of society is wrong because it's your duty as a worker to take part and to, to create this new society together. So again, instead of just this idea of right and wrong, people being able to, per permissible or not permissible, people being able to justify their actions with recourse to the real material world and the actions and the consequences and the aims in a scientific um, manner. So I think for us as Marxists, it is really vital that we have a deep understanding of morality. We obviously grow up in bourgeois society, and we live under pressures from bourgeois ideology. And it is really vital that we do not pander or retreat when we are attacked for being amoral or where we are attacked for a certain action um, being amoral. Um, because that is, that is how morality will be used by the ruling class to try and attack a movement. We understand that mor morality is part of ideology and illusions in bourgeois morality are a key way in which the ruling class maintains its power. We do not believe in natural, eternal, moral truths. We don't believe there's a fixed set of things which are always right and always wrong. But instead, us as thinking, conscious human beings, we have to be the ones who make the judgments on whether an action is right or wrong mm -hmm. through thinking through its consequences and its impact on the class struggle. Um, I'd like to end, I've I'm, I'm kept it fairly short because I think it's a, um, a question where there's going to be a lot of discussion and different things that we can explore. But I would like to end on a quote by Trotsky. Um, and he wrote a fantastic pamphlet called Their Morals and Ours, which I'd really recommend people buying from the bookshop um, on this question of morality. And this pamphlet was again written in the context of the, the bourgeoisie and all of these kind of liberal types attacking um, the Russian Revolution and attacking the USSR on, the, on this basis of it being immoral. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really fantastic um, pamphlet where he outlines all of these kind of points. Um, and anyway, he, he ends with this quote. In these immense events, the Trotskyists learn the rhythm of history. That is the dialectics of the class struggle. They also learned, and it seems to a certain degree successfully, how to subordinate their subjective plans and programs to this objective rhythm. They learned not to fall in despair over the facts that the laws of history do not depend on their own individual talents and tastes and are not subordinated to their own moral criteria. They learned to subordinate their own individual desires to the laws of history. They learn not to become frightened of the most powerful enemies if their power is in contradiction to the needs of the historical development. They know how to swim against the stream in the deep conviction that the new historic flood will carry them to the other shore. Not all will reach the shore, many will drown, but to participate in the movement with open eyes and with an intense will, only this can give the highest moral satisfaction to a thinking being. Thank you.
That's all for this week's episode, so thanks for listening. But before you go, a few announcements. First, Well Read Books has just published a new compilation of Lenin's writings on one of the greatest horrors of capitalism, imperialist war. Not only does it detail why these wars occur, but it goes into how revolutionary communists should intervene to stop them. You can get a copy in the description of this podcast down below. Secondly, just two weeks remain until the World Conference of the Revolutionary Communist International. This event will go down in history as the founding of a new international, a nerve center of all of the revolutionary parties in the world which are each preparing to enter into struggle with their own capitalist class. Not only that, it will also be a school with over 20 talks on dialectics, the national question, imperialism, capitalism, Stalinism, and many more. Do not miss out. You can tune in online or you can set up a watch party with communists in your area. You can sign up below at schoolofcommunism.com. That brings us to the end of this episode of Marxist Voice. We'll be back shortly with another talk from the podcast of the Revolutionary Communist Party.